Well, Charles starts. Um, Coinscrum.com has finally launched thanks to the work from Tom. Do you remember you thought the night before you sat down to start writing the white paper? Actually, I don't even remember what the exact day, day was. It's, uh, I was in San Francisco at the time. I, uh, and I remember I had been thinking about MasterCoin at the time. And I, I had come up with, uh, a few days before this with this uh, concept called ultimate scripting, which, would, which was like, sort of like a precursor to Ethereum. But the idea was that it would just sort of introduce a kind of arithmetic formula language to MasterCoin to make it just a bit more powerful. And at, at some point, uh, there was this one day when in the morning I realized that, wait, you know, there's, if you just expand this just a step more, then it suddenly becomes much more powerful. And I, you know, took a th this long three-hour walk through, I think, the, the garden, the Presidio Gardens in San Francisco, and f basically figured out at least all of the, all of the initial details. Hmm. Cool. How long did you spend sitting down and writing and editing that? Um, the initial version, I think, like one or two days, but then I sent that out. Then you know I got replies back, and then once I realized just how much interest there was, eventually I just sort of kept on expanding it, kept on sort of making it more and more complete, and uh, then you know over the course of one to two weeks, it sort of ballooned to around thirty thousand words. And you're asked to explain Ethereum to a developer that has never touched cryptocurrencies in a few sentences. How do you go about it? So, the, I mean, actually one of my favorite descriptions of Ethereum that I've seen lately is uh, PHP in the sky. So, it's this kind of programming language where, you know, you don't really need to care where it is, you don't need to care who's running it, but, you know, it just runs and you can trust that it is going to run. So, yeah. Bitcoin has political and monetary activism inherent in its code. Yeah. What's the driver behind the development of Ethereum? Interesting question. Is, you know, originally I just came up with uh, with this. I mean, I saw these people working on these protocols that were just unleashing. S seems like they were going to unleash so much possibility, and I just came up with this uh, one particular way of you know improving them and. That's, you know, it seems to me immediately like this was something that a lot of people would find useful, you know, un, un, although at the time I was kind of afraid that, you know, there was some kind of weird cryptographic reason why it wasn't viable at all. And for the first two weeks, I just expected to get an email from us coming from someone basically telling me that. Eventually didn't and eventually sort of more and more, more people just started showing up. And so... And I don't think there is any sort of one particular motivation behind the whole thing. Um, and as far as political views go, I think I've uh, definitely sort of more pragmatic in some ways than I was two years ago, though I'm definitely, definitely not the same as you know people like, people like Blythe Masters and so forth. It's, uh, in blockchains in general, it, there are it's important to note that no te technology really is fully politically neutral and everything has some values to it and you know if you do believe in they're fundamentally about individual empowerment and if you think that individual empowerment is a, is a bad idea then you probably should not like blockchains and you probably should want to try to destroy them by by any means possible and but at the same time you know it is a very big tent and i'm actually really happy to see how you know you have all sorts of you know libertarian capitalists basic income ag advocates you know just regular people in interested in things like you know things like whether it's crowdfunding or voting or whatever else and the you know they're all building applications and they're all sort of taking their own different paths to improving the world over the past five days the talk in the room has been microsoft private chains, banks. Not the only talk in the room, but it definitely occupied most of my hearing space. Mm -hmm. um, are you afraid that 10 years down the road, Ethereum will get corporatized? Hmm, that's, 
An interesting question. I mean, it's that I think that one of the things that you might have noticed with the uh, blockchain crypto space in general in the past sort of one and a half to two years is that people have rapidly sort of caught on to this meme that you can partner with a large organization and make yourself look massively credible because, you know, to a naive person, you know, company X is working with JP Morgan sounds incredible, but the reality is that, you know, if mega corporations have 100 times more employees than small corporations, which makes them 100 times more impressive, but it also means that they have 100 times more people with which they could just throw a few at every single project and uh, to make sure that they cover absolutely everything. So, that's, you know, I think there, there's, there's definitely some of that in the Ethereum space as well. You know, there's the perception that people see these partnerships as being very impressive. And so people like kind of putting them front and center because basically because that's how they convince people that this is actually real and it's not just a bunch of crazies. So whether or not that's, uh, there's a risk of sort of Ethereum becoming corrupted in some sense. Um, it depends what you mean by Ethereum, I suppose, because I think one of the really important properties of this code is the fact that it's this uh, decentralized thing that, you know, people, that's not controlled by any one group, and there is a strong consensus that it's not supposed to be controlled by any one group. And on some level, you know, even when I talk to some of these corporations, they kind of recognize that that's why people are, that, are interested. So that, I mean, I, you know, do I think there's some risk that at some point, you know, there, the sort of the Ethereum Foundation or whatever body ends up having the most social capital is going to be taken over by a bunch of banking bodies that put in mandatory KYC? Actually, I think the probability there is pretty low. I mean, you could argue that there are sort of opportunities for corruption on the margins, like, you know, if the, if some group has an 100k to a uh, hundred thousand dollars to spare is it going to spend it on privacy enhancing software or is it going to spend it on you know even faster high frequent high frequency trading settlement clearing bitcoin had the lehman brothers meltdown in 2008 yes so it's not so much about individual empowerment empowerment but we're getting there in 2010 there was the wikileaks blockade this is what brought the first real rise of Bitcoin because of individual yeah. empowerment. Then came um, the Silk Road, mm -hmm. again, individual empowerment. Yeah. Then came Cyprus and the state taking um, a bailing out of the middle class deposits, again, yeah. possibly individual. What do you think will be the case, the global case, that Ethereum will be um, set up to be the alternative for individual empowerment? Or do you think that's not the case with Ethereum? Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, Ethereum definitely empowers individuals to do a lot of things. You know, Bitcoin is a, this sort of cross-border currency and it makes it very easy for s small groups of people that are potentially international to, like, move, to move money between each other. With Ethereum, you know, you could imagine people creating entire corporations that are kind of run on the blockchain. I think you know, people also talk about this as being a kind of framework for trust. And the concept of kind of a low-cost framework of trust is, I think, by itself sort of strongly in that direction. Because right now, I think one of the reasons why we, ha why we have you know, large institutions to the extent that, they, that we do is because they are, they are trusted. You know, people, people know the brands, and it's, uh, it's, it's a lot easier for people to kind of get behind that as opposed to getting behind some service made by a few people in their basements that you know could end up working well or could end up breaking and stealing all their money so with you know the things like smart contracts you actually have the ability for people basically you know 15 year olds in their basements to create services that you can mathematically prove are exactly as trustworthy as stuff that's being put out as by jp morgan and that is empowering for the 15 year old Say um, Bitcoin suffered lack of money that went to development, mm -hmm. which um, was then covered by the Bitcoin Foundation. It was an organization that was created after the fact to try and um, address mm -hmm. a problem. Yes. And that didn't work. There was a real big failure for Bitcoin that left really bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Um, Ethereum, on the other hand, decided to create the foundation before the launch, or just about. Mm -hmm. um, and 
not being part of Ethereum and just reading the Reddit and the Twitter feeds, I know that there's been a lot of internal politics of people going yes. in and out of Ethereum. So it's definitely something that is very needed to have some sort of a foundation that everyone agrees with. That being said, there is also a problem with um, centralization of um, nodes and mining yes. within Ethereum. Do you think these are the two main problems that could undermine Ethereum, or do you see something like a bug in the system or something that could come in later? What do you think? Um, I mean, yeah, Ethereum is definitely taking a different path in its evolution than Bitcoin did. I mean, on some degree, you know, the the start was more central, more centralized, and on some level, that was a good thing. You know, as there was a foundation, the foundation had thirty thousand bitcoins, it managed to pay for a huge amount of developments to get to just sort of force the ecosystems to, to, to like jump all the way to roughly where Bitcoin was back in 2012 or 2013. So now, of course, the question is, how is this going to continue evolving in the future? And, you know, is there going to be some kind of a strong foundation in the middle? What, you know, what exactly is, are there going to be other foundations? What exactly are particular organizations going to be doing? How is governance going to be done? How is funding going to be done? Those are definitely open questions. And you know, I think we've seen how you know, Bitcoin's definitely been having huge problems in trying to figure that out as well. And I'm sure we're going to start see, seeing some of those issues ourselves. But you know, on some level, it's kind of hard to predict exactly low what's going to happen. Um, Stuff that I that could be a threat to the ecosystem. Um, I mean, in general, you know, just just about everywhere, there's the there is this sort of chronic problem that public goods are underfunded, and pretty much no one has been able to come up with any any kind of uh, consistent solution, you know, other than just uh, having governments run around and take for thirty percent of people's money and. I have a feeling it's going to be a while before governments agree to take percentages of people's money to, to pay for cryptocurrency technology development, so that's kind of not going to happen. Um, so the, um, I mean, one of the sort of arguments that some people make is because we have this concept of DAOs and you know you have things like token issuance and so forth that it offers some kind of novel opportunities for people to do things without you know, to, to, to kind of mitigate the problem that weren't really available before. And that's definitely an area that's kind of worth experimenting in. Mm -hmm. As far as other technical problems, you know, forks could happen. Um, any kind of sort of critical software bugs could happen. Those are, I think, the kind of wild cards. It's really hard to predict the, the probability there. Who's funding? Um, development for Ethereum. Who's funding development? Well, right now it's been, up until now, it's been mostly the foundation. And the foundation, you know, it's got its income basically by selling Ether. And so from now on, I mean, the foundation still has funding and the foundation still is continuing to fund you know, the Go clients, some of the other, some of the other clients and some, and some research. But Increasingly, we are kind of seeing people employed by other organizations also sort of take part. So in the long term, I mean, it could turn into something closer to the Bitcoin model where you just have developers paid by, com paid by companies and it's some, you know, some combination of Microsoft, whatever, whatever uh, other groups, you know, Augur, you know, hopefully a few, uh, a few startups. But it's hard to tell. In practice, I think one of the sort of important discoveries, discoveries that I've personally made over the past couple of years. And it's also just important not to kind of over -for formalize things too much because in a lot of these cases, especially with research, you know, people, can, uh, most of the people who sort of contribute to Ethereum research do so just because they love Ethereum and they just want to work together. And it's not, it's not even clear that establishing any kind of formal structure around that is even going to be beneficial at all. So it's, in some cases, it's more, I mean, it's not just a matter of sort of funneling money to the right sources. It's also just a, a, a sort of question of people. And fortunately, you know, it's, in a lot of places, this question is actually easier. Do you think it's like a conflict of interest, though, if, if a corporate sponsor does? Um, it is. Um, and. On some level, you know, in small ecosystems, conflicts of interest are inevitable. 
So, you know, in I think in general, one of these sort of other problems that sort of that well, both sort of centralized companies and you know, just about every ecosystem has. I think there's like there's different kinds of values that are more important for small organizations and different kinds of values that are more important for large organizations. So I think like issues like you know preventing conflicts, I think in very small organizations in practice it pretty much always takes second place to expediency and it probably should. But in larger organizations, you know, that becomes a larger problem because you, you're not in an environment where people everyone trusts everyone else anymore. And you know, the question is, can you actually manage that transition well? Mm -hmm. hmm. Thank you so much for talking. Yeah. Thank you. Well. And Charles just wanted to come and talk about, or just give a general musings.